Hey guys, so today we are going to talk about C Sharp and Node and why some companies would have a C Sharp backend, some big companies, and use Node for the front end. So let's get into it. So I had a person reach out regarding something that was confusing him. He had this instance where he was looking at a company who had basically showcased one of their architectures for their main systems, right? And the basic idea of what they had, or the, let's just call it the gist of it, right, was that their backend systems that was pretty much a monolithic application of some sort built in C Sharp and .NET, they had, the, had this monolithic giant system and in front of that they had several smaller services that were written in Node.js. And this was something that was very confusing to him because it's something that, I mean, uh, it, for him it felt like a really weird way of structuring your application. Now, this is, uh, I, I can understand this, it can feel very confusing and this is the sort of thing that when you have worked for a large corporation or if you have worked on any project where there is a fair bit of code and you have multiple stakeholders and so forth, when you have some real work experience with professional grade software development, these things start to actually make sense to you. The reason why they don't make sense to someone who is less experienced or a junior or a freelancer or something like that is because they've never been in a situation where they've been forced to consider a massive amount of code that is already existing. And when you don't have to do that, when everything is pretty much a greenfield project or you measure your lines of code in maybe say a few hundred lines, a few thousand lines of code, something like that, then everything is very straightforward. The reason why it's straightforward is because the investment for you to change your mind about something is very low. The only time you would really be in trouble is if you were to, as an example, let's say that you have a greenfield project, you work for a few weeks, few months or something like that. And then you decide, no, I don't want to make this in PHP. I want to make it in Go, as an example. Then you would have to rewrite the whole code base. Now, at that level, you may feel a little bit of a cringe because uh, that's going to be a little bit of a hassle. And I mean, maybe it's worth it, but at the same time, I mean, it's a lot of work. Now, imagine you scale that up by a hundred times, maybe a thousand times in terms of code. Imagine that you have a company that has been around for say 30 years and over those 30 years they have been building in accordance with the times at that point in, in history. In other words, they have been around for so long that what you call microservices and best practices, this is just a new fad to them. They have been here before you even, you were born, or well, not necessarily before you were born, but they have been here before that even the concept was created. They were here when soap was the thing. They were here before that as well. Now imagine that company over all those years. Do you think that they were just building up towards what we have today? I mean, the, these companies could have been around before even Google, like the, before even these best practices were created, right? And they have been innovating. They have been building features in accordance with what was correct for that time. They have been the sort of driving force of company that has gone through the learnings that all of these other companies today who start from scratch or start at a, like used are fairly recent, like those learnings that they have taken from the industry and then built on top of, that's exactly these sorts of companies that would have such a system, right? It doesn't have to be exactly like this, but it's a, it's a very, very common scenario. Now, C Sharp and Java and these more conservative languages are very, were, have been for a very long time, extremely popular in these large organizations. Now, let's just pretend for a moment that you as that company over all these years, because this is not just about code, it's about management. It's about how you organize your, like the, the philosophy, if you will, of how the companies run. Now, it used to be very common that you had a monolithic application and you would invest heavily into that. And the problem is that 
as time progresses, even a company such as Facebook and Google will have issues. Like they have learned from these companies what not to do because these companies, the reason why quite a few people argue that enterprise level development or working for a really big corporation is going to be quite a lot slower than working at a startup is for one of the, for this main reason. You have so much code, a big super system that's been around for years. There might be so much code that not the, like a few people even know exactly how it works, right? And you have all these features that whenever you want to make a change, whenever you want to do anything, you have to sh not only check the thing that you changed, you have to check every goddamn thing around. You might have development processes that take quite a lot like that require a lot of overhead and a lot of complexity just to deliver something. These slow more moving organizations, they are slow for usually for two reasons. Number one, they have a like a management strategy that usually takes quite a lot of stakeholders to get in line in order to deliver something. I know for a fact that there's quite a lot and I work with some of these organizations where if you want to add a button to a web page, that's not a conversation that you have with yourself and one of the developer. It's a conversation you have with five different section heads that needs to all schedule a meeting to have that discussion. And then they need to make an evaluation or fill out a bunch of uh, value propositions. And I mean, that's a, that, that's a discussion, a feature that could take months to get to actually go to where it needs to be, right? It might not even happen because the risk analysis is too high, right? Now, this, this organization has the same problem as any other company. And that problem is that the times are moving on. People are expecting things quicker. They're expecting things to uh, kind of stay relevant. Not only their customers are expecting this, but the people, so like the new people, the fresh, the, the new blood they hire into the company, like new section heads, they want to be able to move quicker. And the company wants that as well. It's just that they're dragging along this super system that in this case was written in C sharp, that you mean they can't just throw that away because that's like, we're talking about a serious investment in terms of money and features and so forth. You can't just rewrite that system, even in a year, most likely, even if you start from scratch, all the stuff that you would simply create a situation where you try to rewrite the system. This has happened many times, guys. People have tried to rewrite systems and like create consistent APIs and so forth when they have multiple big systems and you know, somehow make it nicer. It's very hard. It's extremely hard when you have that much code. So an approach to this, which is extremely common in large organizations is that you would have a backend system. You would have this monolithic super application that maybe a handful of people actually know how it works, but they know this fairly well. And what they would do in order to make it possible for the organization to keep on developing new features and actually move quicker is to start an approach to what we call microservices. Now, a lot of people think about microservices as, and I mean, to a point, this is true, but like if we just call it the service oriented architecture, then this is very common. You would have this super system be the provider of all the features and functionality, the core features and functionality that other services depend on. As an example, let's say that you have this super, super backend in C sharp that provides, I don't know, payments of some sort. It's a payment system. It's a big, massive super payment system. Now, if you want to create a small, like a, let's say that you want to create a new, a new website, a new service of some sort, you've realized that, yeah, if we do a few integrations to a few new co companies and we put up a nice website and so forth, and then we still have that feature back there that is really, really useful, then we could make a lot of money. Now, the problem here is that you most likely due to the processes that are in place, because trust me, it's not that easy to just change how a company is working when it's working that, at that, that like such a large scale then you kind of just realize that the easiest way is to like the easiest way to get this done is to just create a new project that consumes and like just calls an endpoint in that backend system. Because if you wanted to shim that feature in into the backend system, you're talking about a development process that might take weeks, if not months, because there's tons of other parts of the departments within that company that depend on a few teams or like a, a series of teams that actually maintain all of this. So that's an, a scenario where a lot of new companies have realized that su such things as a serverless and Node.js in this case, I, 
they can build a new system that depends on the old backend system and they will be able to do that in an autonomous fashion. It will go much faster if they just do it in Node instead, instead of trying to use the same monolithic code base. Because like you, if you think about it from a cost value analysis, you can prototype something very quickly in Node, you can build it very quickly and you can just see if it works. You can hire consultants that very quickly can build that in isolation. This is one of the theories as to why microservices became a thing in the first place. It's a, from a consultancy perspective, building a new service that consumes a backend system that is super, super complicated and business oriented is quicker than it is to actually get like a bunch of consultants to learn that entire super system and figure out how to maneuver within it. And you would be surprised at how many companies who actually do this sort of thing. And if you understand how much work is entailed in this process of migrating things, now this is something that juniors sometimes just don't understand. And that is that why don't you just rewrite it? Why don't you just do this? Well, as I said, if you're trying, if, if your perspective is that you, you, you have like a few hundred or a few thousand lines of code. Yeah, of course it doesn't make sense. That would be very simple, right? But it, that's, it's not like they don't want to do it, guys. It's that to do it, we're talking about months, if not years of work for quite a lot of people. We're talking about maybe like, it, it's a very serious investment for a big company to do this. So having this backend and having like services that consume backends or call backend the back the backend service is a call it a poor man's the poor man's choice for microservices or for for just mitigating this problem with having uh, delivery speed issues and iteration speed issues. So what I want you to take away from this is that when you're talking about systems that have been around for long enough that they've grown to a complexity where it's extremely risky and cost uh, costly to migrate them into a new modern tech stack or something of that nature quite a lot of companies don't want to make that sort of investment so what they do is that they maintain that backend system in the old way of working and then they expose endpoints or some as needed in order to create a situation where new systems can be developed, smaller systems that do something specific. Sometimes it's a prototype, sometimes it's a new product. There's all kinds of use cases for this. And that system only actually needs a few features from that big old super system. And all that this big super system has to do is to actually expose that functionality as an endpoint. And then something like a node service can actually call that in order to get that functionality because it's rare that such a small system would need all of the features that this big system has. I hope that makes sense to you because trust me, this is extremely common. It's actually not unlikely that if you go into corporate level, like enterprise level development, that you will see systems like this when you're working with an organization that isn't like a few years old. So have that with you. Have a great day.